Hello, my name's Lionel Burney, and this is the Cycling Podcast Presents Life in the Peloton. Um, we're delighted to say that we've signed up Life in the Peloton's Mitch Docker for the 2020 season, arguably the biggest transfer of the closed season, I'd say. I can't think of a bigger one at the moment. Um, Mitch Docker, of course, professional rider with EF Education First, about to start on his 12th season in the professional ranks. And this is a fifth year of the podcast Life in the Peloton, one of our favourite cycling podcasts, other than the cycling podcast, of course. Uh, Mitch, perhaps you can explain to our listeners who may be hearing from you for the first time um, what Life in the Peloton is all about. Well, first of all, I'd want to say welcome to the um, cycling podcast family and also back to the Life in the Peloton listeners. I want to say welcome to the new season 2020, the fifth season of the podcast. I can't believe that, but it keeps rolling on and there's just so many more interesting people out there to talk to. And that brings me to what actually Life in the Peloton is about. My listeners already know this and they've sort of been with me along the journey along the way. And more or less what it is, is trying to explain to everyone out there what life is like in the peloton for a pro what our day-to-day life is being on the road with us talking to different people whether it's other pros whether it's staff whether it's doctors whether it's mechanics just understanding what my life is or what all of our life is like on the road as a professional cyclist well your listeners will be relieved to know you won't hear too much from me but um we will introduce each uh edition of life in the peloton mitch which will be released on roughly a fortnightly basis throughout the season and uh, tell us who your guest was for episode one of the 2020 season well episode one was a really great guest i was able to talk to my teammate james whelan jimmy whelan as he's called and i thought it was really interesting talking to him this year last year was his first year as a neo neo pro he's had an interesting story come came through the ranks very quickly as a cyclist he was an ex-runner got injured came through the ranks but in about four years became professional at the world tour so very very green and i was able to watch him from a bit of a distance last year and i was just wondering how that really went his first year so i thought it'd be great to catch up with him before he starts his second year what he's learned what were the hardships what were the good moments and just get his thoughts on what this season was going to bring for him and so where did you catch up with Jimmy uh, paint the scene of where this conversation was taking place Mitch I was able to catch up with him just before Christmas um, in the Australian summer he came up to my house which was great we sat down we had a glass of uh, cold sparkling water actually at this point and um, we just was a really relaxed environment. He's not doing a whole big racing of summer in Australia, just doing the Herald Sun Tour. So he was in a nice space, not too stressed. It was a really sort of great atmosphere. And we just sat down and just and talked out the season. It was a great debrief for me and it was a great debrief for him and just sort of um, a nice preview to the season. Well, let's uh, hear your conversation with James Whelan then, Mitch. And you mentioned deep brief. Perhaps we'll come back at the end and uh, recap the conversation. Fantastic. I hope everyone enjoys it. And I look forward to bringing you a lot of great podcasts this season. Jimmy Whelan. This is the first podcast of the year and I'm really happy to be back on board and especially to have you on board to preview the season, talk about your last season and talk about your season coming. So welcome to the podcast. Welcome back actually. You were last year one of my first podcasts as well at the live podcast. So welcome back to a non-live podcast. Yeah, it's nice to be back on the potty. Yeah. And uh, yeah, good day everyone. Yeah. Nice. Welcome back behind the mic. It's a nice day. I'm going to jump straight into it. Let's just talk about your first year. Last year was your first year as a World Tour pro. And straight up, how was it? Uh, it was the most stressful year of my life, but most enjoyable. Right. Uh, yeah, went through about every emotion possible. New, found new emotions that didn't exist. But uh, yeah, I had, a, I had a blast. A lot changed with my life. I had to get used to a lot of new things, a new environment. 
Um, and yeah, it's a lot of foreign things uh, that I had to get comfortable with. But, Ex- um, explain that. Every You went through new emotions you never thought you had. Explain that. Yeah, I mean, essentially, my whole life context changed. I was living in Europe. Mm. I had to find my feet in Europe. And I was trying to learn a new sport because essentially I came in so late that uh, I hadn't even raced at a semi-professional level, let alone in the world tour. So there was a lot to get used to. Um, but I just had to relax and, and took each day as it came. But also making sure that I was switched on every day and absorbing as much as I could from whether that be like the actual race days um, and down to the tactics and everything, but also just from my teammates, just learning off them, seeing mm. how they, they move around, the way they function on and off the bike. Felt like I uh, never turned my brain off all year. I was just constantly looking at stuff around me. <laughs> I'm back in Australia now. I've been back for two months or a month and a half. Pretty raring to go. To, uh, pretty excited to go back over. What was that like then when you came at the different points during the year? And just when you said that then, I'm back in Australia now. Maybe take it back from that first part. When you first came back to Australia, was it nice to finally come home and just sort of release that valve that... That's you know, like you said, you were concentrating, you were thinking about this, you were trying to absorb this, you were maybe getting in trouble there, then you were trying to improve this. Finally, when you came back to Australia, did it feel like, I'm home, I can just relax for a little bit? Was that the feeling at the end of the season? Yeah, I mean, a pretty easy way to put it, it was like I'd just come home from a, I don't know, 14-hour shift and you've sat down on the couch and taken your shoes off. Yeah. That kind of thing. Um, and life's pretty easy at home, I'm back with the folks. Yeah, back with family and friends, it's pretty comfortable. Living in uh, in Camberwell, it's yeah, it's pretty easy. Mm. And uh, yeah, I've just been catching up with mates, seeing family and friends, and starting to get uh, into some more serious training now. Life's pretty simple when you're living back at home. The fridge restocks by itself. What was that? Stuff. Did you have any of those points during the year as well? Like there was the end of the season release, but there were points during the the middle of the year and. Points where you just went, whether it was the, the right time or not to have a, I'm not going to say a breakdown, but a point where you went, I just need to just check out for a minute. Were there moments during the year where you just went, I need to check out for a minute here because I'm starting to get overwhelmed? Or was you able to keep on top of things? Yeah, it was it was pretty full on and I didn't really know where my limit was and I just kept going. Mm. Um, I know in the middle of the year, if you're not doing the tour, you kind of have a little break in the middle of, in July. Mm. And I knew that I had... I'd raced the Tour of Norway, then went straight to the Dauphiné, and then did uh, what's Route de Sud. So it was kind of a big race block. And all hard races too. And yeah. like Dauphiné, Libre is a very... For people out there who don't know, this is, this is actually a well-seasoned pros race because the Tour de France is around the corner. So most of the people, 90% of the riders, are trying to get in the Tour de France team if they haven't already been selected, are in that kind of form. And if they're not, they're there, they're very experienced pros doing a very hard race. To be thrown in that as a neo pro and also as a real novice to the sport as well, that would have been, you know, a huge race. How was that experience in that race? Yeah, I mean, it was pretty full on. Uh, There's everything. I mean, obviously the companies, the pelotons are really high standard. Yeah. The parkour is really difficult. (laughs) Yeah. But I think the the most difficult thing about that race this, uh, this year was the weather. Yeah. Uh, it was freezing cold most days. And uh, some of the most crazy conditions I've ever ridden in oh. uh, were going up a few climbs and down the down the descent. So it was a pretty full-on week. Hmm. Um, I'm glad I didn't know what I was signing up for before the races. Yeah. But, yeah, when I got back after that, that like, three-stage race block, and then I finally got back to my apartment in Girona and was told to have a full week off, it was a similar thing to coming back to Australia. It was, uh, yeah, I mean, I was, pr- I was proud of myself getting through it all and, uh, yeah, experiencing it all and absorbing it. Um, but at the same time, I was like, far out. That was <laughs> definitely the most crazy month of my life. Totally. Like, and I think, like, and to give everyone an example, like, James, he raced 66 race days this year. I had a look up before mm-hmm. just to double check how many days you did. I only did 70 myself. You know, only four more days than you. And this season was my 12th year professional. So there's not a lot different. You took on a massive load for a young guy. How did that feel? And did you imagine that amount of racing? Or did it just feel sort of somewhat normal? You just took it on. Well, everything was new. So I didn't really have a standard. So mm. whether I did 90 days or 20 days, it just would have been like, okay, well, that's, that's what it is. 
I didn't think I'd get through the full season to be honest mm. uh, what, when, what did you think would happen well when I was uh, I don't know I thought I'd just get pretty worn out to be honest yeah okay pretty like overwhelmed by the stress and everything of I don't know the racing and just uh, the lifestyle living lifestyle. on your own pretty, yeah pretty full on yeah so like looking back at it uh, I'm pretty happy to get through a full season that was uh, mm. in my opinion the most important thing totally because like the worst thing that could have happened was would be to like crash out in April or something and then that was it because um, the thing that I need is experience to come back to Australia and have that box ticked is uh, pretty good and also just to as stressful as it was um, I really enjoyed myself and I mean because when I signed up last year uh, with EF I didn't really know what I was signing up for I hadn't lived the space yet so I didn't even know whether I was was going to enjoy it because I hadn't done it before like living in Europe and everything so it's pretty daunting but it's pretty nice also to come back and be like yeah I actually really enjoy this I feel like a bike rider now yeah nice Um, because to give everyone a bit of background and let's let's rewind right back before you're even a pro and even before you're a rider so give everyone a little bit of a background where you've come from and how you've been able to rise through the ranks so quickly to world tour because this is a very uncommon thing for someone like you to do to give everyone a little bit an idea of how big a leap that was this year to be in the world tour Exactly, like, you know, just to understand that context. It's even a big leap for a guy who's been riding for 10 years. Finally makes that leap to the world too. It's a big step, but for you, where have you come from? Yeah, I mean, to put it pretty simply, I was a a runner up until 2016, um, racing, like, domestically in Australia. Mm. Kind of going from the junior ranks to the senior ranks. And then uh, got a bit of an Achilles injury and couldn't train the way I needed to to be the runner I wanted to be. So, uh called it a bit of an early retirement on running and then in how old were you then so i would have been 19 okay um and then the summer of 2016 uh started racing local crits and then did the nationals road race in 2017 um and then raced domestically in, uh, throughout that year and then i was able to fall in love with the sport make new mates and uh was able to uh, get some opportunities racing the Herald Sun Tour in and uh, in the start of 2018 with the Australian team. So this is your third year ever riding a bike? Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, with that, uh, a good Sun Tour and a good Nationals, I was able to then race for the National team over the um, European summer. And so that was uh, some of the one-day races earlier on in the year and then also uh, the Lavenir. Mm-hmm. Um, Tour de Lavenir, yeah. which is which is the mini Tour de France, and yeah. a lot of people are looking at that race for the new talent coming through. Yeah. So I consider myself really lucky just to get the opportunity to race for the national team, given I'd only really raced at that high domestic level for a few months. Mm. And then it just so happened to be that my first European bike race was Tour of Flanders, <laughs> which I was able to win. Yeah, which was Under 23 Tour of Flanders, yeah. yeah. Which at the time I didn't realise how much that would change my life. <laughs> um and so, and then with that, I was then able to make the jump to World Tour. So it was obviously really, really fast. Yeah. Um, which, from the outside in, you think, oh, that's awesome. But at the same time, it's like there's a lot of uh, development that I've missed, mm. and then I'm trying to catch up whilst experiencing the racing at this level, which uh, is proving to be stressful. Um, but also, it's a pretty special place to be in, and I consider myself pretty lucky. But um, yeah, and then two broken wrists last year, so I didn't get to do Lavenir didn't get to do the world championships and then I essentially reset and then uh, got ready for uh, last year which was my first uh, first season with EF and as a Neo Pro so. I saw you that moment of everything catching up because like as you explained then there were big steps and every time you got set a new challenge you were able to get over that step and move on to the next step there was nothing from what I can understand there they were really hard challenges along the way, but what's allowed you to be in the World Tour now after four years riding a bike was you were able to overcome those challenges. And one of the small insights I got to you being a little bit out of your depth was only in Tour Down Under last year. Yeah. And it was when we were going down the gorge. <laughs> yeah, and I it wasn't, didn't mention that. <laughs> and it wasn't because you weren't physically good enough, and I don't think that's ever been a problem. And I think that's... a something that I think a lot of people underestimate is 
And I even forget about it myself, riding a bike for so long, you forget what you pick up after all those years and what you're able to do without even thinking about it. As we were going down the gorge, and if anyone knows this, it's just going into the corkscrew, we're probably doing 100k an hour down there, and you're just thinking like you're only doing 30 kilometers an hour, and you're just positioning. That's the way I think. I've just got to move him there, I've got to move that guy there. And (laughs) you had quite an important job that day to help Woodsy over the climb. I remember coming out of that last corner thinking, where's bloody Jimmy? Like, it's his job. I've just got Woodsy into the climb. And then I just had a moment to think about what actually just happened. We're going down this descent at 100k an hour. Guys going left, right and centre. And I was like, maybe that was just a little bit of a step too far on the bike positioning side of things. What was that like? That was a massive eye-opener. Yeah. Um, and, And as you said, I was in the... I had the legs to be really valuable up that corkscrew. And so I had the opportunity to be really valuable to the team. But that was a very, very stressful, like, 10 minutes going down the gorge road and just seeing how relaxed everyone else was. Well, like, they're just used to it. And then seeing, like, I was kind of almost, like, looking at myself being, like, I'm so uh, out, like, out of my depth here. And it was, and it was really frightening, to be honest. Yeah. Like, I've never been uh, in a situation like that. Like, it wasn't like some guys where they were just like, all right, once we get to the cor- corner of the corkscrew, we can just chuck in a little ring and we'll, we'll see tomorrow's stage. I had a, I had a role to do. Yeah. And uh, our, our DS, Tom Southern, uh, gave me the benefit of the doubt and thought that I could do it, and I failed to do it. And so, yeah, it was stressful. Um, but I also need, needed that as well. Totally. Yeah. yeah. And I, yeah. sorry to interrupt, I was about to say, I don't think anyone ever cast any judgment on you for that moment because we all knew the reasons behind it and what I loved about that was I haven't raced for you since that race actually I was since well the Australian yeah. summer last year yeah. so from what I've heard around there's been a massive progression this year and what I wanted to speak to you about now was that was right back in January what's happened over the year is you came through each race and you're able to take on things like the gorge and apply it to the next race and take on by the time you came to a race like Brunsapel and Flesh you were doing things, from what I hear, you were doing things that were another step up. Run me through what happened throughout the season when you were able to apply that stuff that you learned from each race. Yeah, I mean, with my, one of my biggest learning points was UAE Tour as well, learning how to ride crosswinds and in a big group. Yeah, I found myself with each race, I would just be getting better and better at positioning. I mean, there'd be some races where I'd stuff it up again and I'd be quite frustrated. I think it's okay to make mistakes, but if you make the same mistakes again, then you kind of got to look at yourself a little bit critically because mm. there's no excuses. You're a paid bike rider and you've got to like do your job. Um, but yeah, I had a few good rides. Yeah, my, my best ride was uh, probably Bavance Peel with positioning and stuff. Yeah, I actually had, uh, I don't know how to put it, but actually the balls to be right at the front right, and kind of throw my weight around a little bit. Mm. Um, how did that feel? Were you like, I'm getting this. Yeah. I'm actually getting this thing. Yeah, that that day was really important for me because it, it made me realize that it wasn't like a, a skill set per se that I didn't have, but more just a mental switch uh, that, yeah, that like bulldog attitude. Um, and it's easier said than done. You made it sound so easy that someone just has to go, oh, I just got to get the balls and do it. But yeah. look, I'm still, I still struggle with that at times too, you know, coming into different segments and sprints and whatever I have to also get past that every single race so yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about yeah and just learning to relax yeah and being like thinking out, and also just appreciating what I was doing as well thinking how cool it is what I'm doing right now and also having Clarky yelling at me from behind to do this and that it gets easy I don't have to think <laughs> yeah it does help with someone giving you the yeah. experience yeah So moving on to this year then, what have you been able to take on from the whole season and now how are you thinking towards this season about what you want to apply to this year? What you what have you learned from the season and what are you going to apply to this year? Yeah, I mean, last year the team didn't have any expectations of me per se. They understood how green I was and they just said I needed to experience what, uh, what it was like to be a new pro in the world tour. Um, but this year... I'm no longer the new guy. I've got a bit more responsibility. At least I think that. Yeah, totally. Um, and yeah, this year's... Uh, I'm pretty excited to 
be competitive at the the final of bike races and also I'm just excited to see things again uh, to be going back to bike races that I've done before will be like it, it'll be more like I'll be more relaxed going into it and understanding the space will be exciting um, and also just to compare how much I've improved like so you know obviously the racing side of things you're not going to be in the dark now when you go to a race like Flesh yeah. Malone or you know even Copper Bartley yeah. or races like this if you do them again yeah. and I want to touch on that too in a minute about your race program but what about outside the racing? What are some things that you may have learned with training or where are you at now in comparison to where you were at this time last year? You're just purely mentality. I know you had a bit of a different goals, but I remember I was talking to you a couple of days ago and you were telling me about how you've been able to build a, a, a bit different foundation coming into this season. I think that's got a lot to do with the mentality as well, apart from the goals or the program that's set. I mean... My build-up to this year compared to last year is completely different. Uh, essentially, my season starts a, a month later. I've actually been able to do a proper base phase and to prioritise my European season, which I didn't really see as valuable at all last year. Um, and I came in so red hot. I was super fit in December. I was probably like the fittest world tour rider in December, but I never saw that form again physically throughout mm. the year. Like when I head back overseas next year, uh, well this year, um, I'm pretty excited just to already have all my clothes in uh, my place and essentially uh, have my setup here over there it mm. makes life a lot easier. And also just uh, being in a familiar bed and everything. Take me back to then your thoughts. So I remember riding with you last year in December or year before in December, whatever it was. Yeah. And we're just doing a recon of Sun Tour. And I nicknamed you Jimmy Half Wheelin back then because we were doing an easy ride, but you couldn't quite grab the concept of just because you were just eager, keen, and easy for you at that point was way too hard for me. Have Has there been a bit of a, a thought process when you look back at yourself 12 months ago and go... I get it now. I sort of get what I needed to be doing last year or are you pretty content with what you were doing last year? I'm not critical of what I did last year. I think uh, first year in the World Tour, you know, you're coming up to your first race with the team. Yeah. You'd be concerned if I didn't, like, uh, yeah, you'd be concerned if I wasn't going in like that. Yeah. yeah. I came in super hot and I wouldn't change that at all. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously one thing that I learned the hard way is that you can only have the light on for so long. And, uh, yeah, you can't... Mentally, it's... Uh, and physically, it's pretty difficult to be running so hot in November all the way through to October the next year. Yeah. Um, and now that I've had a year of a full season, I can now properly understand the mental and physical load associated with the, mm. the World Tour calendar on and off the bike. Mm. And understanding that, you know, you only have so many biggies and you can't... Uh, yeah, you can't be uh, going too full gas in December. Um, mm. And luckily, the team's given me the opportunity to slow things down a bit um, right now, where I can do a proper base training and start my, my season a bit later, which means I miss out on uh, some of the Aussie stuff. But at the same time, it means that I can uh, properly approach the 2020 season the way a European bike rider would, and hopefully that sees me... Uh, in, in good stead for March, April, and so forth. Totally. Using yeah. your bullets where you want to use them. Yeah. yeah. All right, let's talk about that now because I guess some people are wondering, how does how does a, someone's program come about? You know, do we get to just choose our program and go, you know, I want to do the Giro and the Tour and Roubaix and every big race on the calendar, or how does it all work? So I guess explain what happened to you after last year. You got a bit of experience around different races. Were you able then to speak to our head directors, Charlie Wigelius? Were you able then to give some feedback to him about what races you wanted to do, or did he just decide for you? How did it come about this year's 2020 program for you? Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously Charlie Wigelius is our like a race director, and we've also got our sports directors as well. And so my sports director is Tom Southern. I've caught up with him a fair bit over the last few months and we've talked about my season, talked about what type of bike rider I think, I'm, think I am. And or, did that, sorry to interrupt, did that change from last year before you started riding in Europe 
you thought maybe you were going to be this rider and after a season you're like, oh, I might, maybe I'm a bit more this rider. Has that changed? or? Yeah, I think um, at first you don't really know what type of bike rider you are until you properly ride at that level. You think you're good at something, but there's actually people that are way better at than you. But um, I'm more of a punchy climber than I thought I'd be. Hmm. I thought I'd be... Um, long climber. Long climber. Oh. But, yeah. Um, Do you compare yourself to, say, Mike Woods? Yeah. I mean, I think Mike Woods is probably... A, a, bit more anaerobic perhaps yeah but um i mean it's, it's hard to say i think uh my role within the team is uh being a team player right now as mm-hmm. opposed to going up climbing super fast but um yeah i'm still working it out what type of rider i am to be honest yeah and um, it's, it continues to happen throughout your whole career yeah, i yeah. have to admit yeah. yeah i mean you see riders change and they can be like a 12 year pro and all of a sudden they're, they're a different type of rider yeah um, and I guess it depends on what training you're doing and whatnot. And yeah. So were you able to converse then with Tom, and was he able to help you work it out? And was he a good sounding board that you hoped he was feeding back to Charlie, or how did it work? Yeah. So Tom, I caught up. I went on two rides with Tom, and uh, we had chats over over WhatsApp and whatnot. Yeah. Um, yeah, just about the year and what my goals were for the following year, and what my calendar could look like, and that uh, he'd have a chat to Charlie. Um, but yeah I mean basically he's like the the messenger to Charlie and yeah he's and he's a good ear he's uh he's helped me a lot this year yeah and then obviously we Charlie and the performance team sit down they work out like obviously you have the main riders um and then they work out what team is best for that race um and then from that they'll give you the call and say all right this is this is the plan for 2020 Mm. um but I mean the nature of the sport is uh you have your program but it could change all the time yeah let's touch on now some stuff some general 2020 stuff now what did you think of the release of Jumbo Visma already I've never seen that happen before that the Tour de France team the whole team has been released already yeah it's uh it's a bit bizarre it's strange to see uh but it's also cool gets people thinking I've got the team here (laughs) it's ridiculous Tom Dumoulin Steven Kreuzweg and you know Primoz Roglic who those three guys themselves, you know, Tom and Primoz have won Grand Tours. Kreuzberg, as you know, almost won the Giro there too. Mm. Then they've got the rest of them. You've got Tony Martin, just to ride the front and just be an absolute unstoppable yeah. force. Walt Van Aert, who is an unstoppable force himself. Seb Kass, Robert Gersink, and Lawrence de Plus. So it's a massive team already. And like you already mentioned with your own program, a lot can happen before then. But I sort of like that. They've given those guys the confidence because I don't really, I've never had this happen in even any of the teams that I'm in that a whole squad knows they're going to the tour. And the team's given them that amount of confidence to go benchmark that, be ready, we want you there, you're in the squad. They've never, they haven't put that like, maybe if you're good enough, maybe, you know, tactic mm. in there. They're like, no, nah, yeah. we want you there. What do you think about that? Would you like that to be for you for, you know, certain races? Yeah, I mean it'd be. I mean it's it's cool to see teams making it so public. I think it's good for the sport and gets people talking about uh, the races before they even happen, and then it gets other teams thinking as well. Um, and it also gets the fans excited for the races coming up. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean the nature of the sport just a lot of names change for races uh, at the last minute. So. But for a race like the uh, the Tour de France, I guess you can do a public release like that because, uh, it, yeah, you can put such an importance on it. That's and right. What do you think about with Ineos then? Who's going to lead this team? Three Tour de France previous winners are probably going to be on the start line. You've got Chris Froome, Garrett Thomas, and last year's winner, yep. Egan Bernal. So it's going to be an interesting dynamic, dynamic there. You know, they've almost got too much power you know what I mean it's yeah. like are they going to be able to work together what do you think about that well it looks pretty similar to the trio with Jumbo Visma as well um, but I guess the biggest question that everyone seems to be talking about is um, Froome getting back to uh, the rider he well he can be mm. um, and then do they assume that they that he can be uh, the rider he was and yeah it's it's, it's pretty hard to say and I guess uh things will start to piece together as the race the racing goes on important to get off with the right foot mm. when you look at quick step they just like they bounce off each other they feed each other like success for each success I want to go 
step back and talk to you about a couple of other little things. Were there any riders this year that, you know, you imagine, I remember talking to you last year in Tour Down Under in Adelaide, and I said, you know, who are your, who is your inspiration? Who are the guys you looked up to? Now being in the peloton and the guys you were riding around and guys that you maybe didn't even know about or guys you thought were a different person, now that you've been side by side, who are the guys you really respect now and, and maybe look up to and think, you know what, I really like what he does. I want to sort of build myself around that sort of rider or that type of rider. Who, who do you really respect after this season? Yeah, I mean, obviously I spend a lot of time with teammates, so um, obviously I've got a lot of respect for a lot of guys within the team now. But outside of the team, it's... Um, who in the team then? Well, obviously Mike Woods. Um, he's is that pretty- because of the running background? or is Well, that- initially, obviously, we got that connection. Um, but it's more so just because he came into the late in a pretty different circumstance. Yeah, he came into the sport under pretty di- different circumstances and came in quite late and had to make that jump and learn quickly. Mm. So he's been a good person to to check in with with regards to like how, how did you learn how to do this so quick. Um, Give me an example. Did uh, you actually say that to him? Yeah, yeah. Well, for example, uh, obviously I was wasting a lot of energy in bike races going down a hill because I wasn't as quick as everyone else, didn't have the technical skills. And then he told me that he got a descending coach. Oh. Um, and then he was able to link up through the team to, for the team to organise for me to get a descending coach, and it was the same person. Did you get one? Yeah. So uh, in Girona, I was able to. What did practice. they? What did they teach you? What did he teach you? Or he? I had a few sessions. Uh, initially, it was just around car parks, learning like the limit of the tire and how hard you can actually take a corner. Did you find the limit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you go over the limit? Yeah, you went over the limit. Did you? <laughs> well, you kind of have to go over to work it out. <laughs> Did you hit the deck? Yeah, yeah, slid out. <laughs> um, and nice. then just also just, uh, yeah, on a few cents. And then the following session, um, I mean, the car park, just to go back to the car park, uh, we'd have cone work. Mm. So it was almost like uh, being back in the soccer days when I was a 13-year-old, like dribbling a soccer ball through cones, in, but I had a bike between my legs instead of a soccer ball. Um so that was cool. Cool. Um, and just learning how to sit on the bike properly and actually do the right balance and have your weight on your saddle instead of, you know, f- being too far forward or, yeah, Ooh. just small things. Who was this guy? Was he? What's his background? So he's a former World Cup mountain biker. Oh, right. And he lives just out of Barcelona. Hmm. Um, and, yeah, so that was really good. And then he also, uh, the following sessions, he was took me to a few climbs, uh, the Hincapi climb. On uh, near, on the other side of Los Angeles. Yep. And, uh, near Casa de la Selva. Yeah, yeah, it's quite a. Did you go down to the other side? It's quite a technical yeah, descent, yeah, yeah. actually. It's not a very fast descent, but it's very no. technical. Yeah, it's pretty windy and um, it's quiet as well. So I was able to like take the apexes a few times. But yeah, if you look at my Strava, there's this one road where I'm just going up and down this like tiny little section a hundred <laughs> times. I did it for about two and a half hours. Really? And, um, and did you nail it? Yeah, I mean, if. If I was to race someone down a descent, I would choose that road. Because, <laughs> yeah, obviously I know all the corners now. But um, yeah, Are you things. noticing, are you actually noticing it now, even without training? Because racing is another thing too, because they really do go warp street down the descents. But are you noticing it out training that you're moving down the descents easier, more comfortable? Yeah. I mean, obviously, I was always on foreign roads uh, over in Europe. But now that I've come back here and I'm doing climbs that I've done before and going down descents, it's... I feel a lot more comfortable on the bike and it's nice to compare um, what I thought was like a sketchy now it's just like I'm a lot more relaxed mm. um, I used to find all the sense like a little bit daunting but now it's just like you just do it and you mm. go a lot faster you don't think about moving your bike around it just happens mm. so it's been nice to come back home and just see that improvement and that's investing in yourself like and I think that's a, an important thing that a lot of guys take a long time to really work out is that hang on I need to quickly learn this stuff fast. And yep. you've, you've realized that early on that I've got to invest in myself. It's not going to just happen. Someone's not going to organize it for me. I've got to go out and do it. I've got to speak to Woodsy. I've got to organize yep. that. Is there anything else that's been something like that? Yeah. I mean, uh, Woodsy was saying that the best thing he did was get a gravel bike. Um, so he had the Cannondale Slate and I got uh, one of the Super X's. And so I've been doing a lot of my recovery rides on trails out near the Q Boulevard. Mm. And trying to move the bike around the way I haven't before because essentially I've got a 
I've got to learn how to be relaxed just moving the bike around like crazy in the races and that's what I don't and that's a skill that I don't have so the the better I can improve that skill the more relaxed I'll be on the bike which means I'll spend less energy worrying about stuff that's unnecessary um, and then I've also been doing some track stuff oh yeah um, down at disc so racing kind of, I wouldn't call it racing I've been doing their training huh so they got the state guys there um, yeah I mean it was just uh, my director Tom Southern he thought it was a good idea and you look at the track guys uh, they all know how to ride bikes really well in the peloton so obviously there's something there to learn was that hard um, in the beginning to ride around the track? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was it? Yeah, it was. Well, it's really steep for the disc velodrome. Yeah. Um, what did you find hard about? Just the the actual steepness, the the angle of the track. It's yeah. co- it's completely unnatural. Yeah. And I haven't felt that before. <laughs> and then once we actually like, and also just uh, remembering to keep pedaling all the time. Um, <laughs> did you crash there? No, nah, no crashes. <laughs> Touch wood. The feel of a track bike and like the G force you get when you're going proper quick. It's exciting. Um. But yeah, just uh, learning how to handle a new bike. Mm. It's just good for the confidence. Um, and hopefully that'll, like all these small things, um, will add up to being more relaxed on the bike and just being a more complete bike rider mm. so that I can just worry about actually racing and not... And using your physical ability and yeah. not using all your... Like, I, I remember talking to you about it in Down Under. It was like, get to the bottom of the longer. It's a... I don't even know how long it is. How long is that climb in time? five minutes if let's not. just say it's a five yeah. minute climb it's a five yeah. minute climb and I can imagine you were thinking I can probably do those you know what's for five minutes yeah. but it's everything leading into that five minutes and yeah. I think I remember talking to a teammate the year before about it and I was like he couldn't understand why he just couldn't perform up the climb he can do those what's in training it's like yeah. dude that's why Richie Port Daryl Limpy these guys are the best in the world because they get to the bottom of that climb Relaxed, fresh, exactly the same as like they are in training. They're doing that in the race because mm. they're able to handle all that stuff in the race. And you've started to put those footsteps together now, yeah, to make that happen. It's the biggest learning curve in the World Tour is that you can you can rock up to a, a race in the in the form of your life or absolutely creeping. But the biggest thing that'll determine your finishing position is whether you're in the right position. I mean, like a, uh, the Canadian races that I did in Montreal, Quebec. Uh, going up the climb on the third last lap which is where it all split up I was in bad position Charlie uh, was yelling at me over the radio to move up it was already too late it was mm. all strung out and I was on good legs and finished the race when everyone else with me didn't and I tried to do the climb full gas and uh, yeah like my watts per kilo would have been the same as the guys in front but I was two minutes down just because I was out of position mm. there's countless times throughout the year where I've just been like Frustrated at myself because I was out of position, um, but more just disappointed for my teammates because I wasn't able to help them when I should have. And it's it's so difficult because you just like you can't do anything about it. You can't like you said once that once it happens, hmm. like you said you had the legs and you were doing as good a watts as the guy in front. You were probably passing a hundred guys, but unfortunately the race was gone and you just like you feel you feel so bad because you're like oh, I yeah. actually. Yeah. Buggered that up. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you feel incredibly stupid. Yeah. Um, but now that I've come back here, you just have to strip it back. How can I improve that? You mm-hmm. do this, this, this. There's a lot of things to learn from it and a lot of things to do to try and improve from it. So, What's your goal for 2020? My goal for 2020 is to be able to do a review at the end of the year and say I'm a much better bike rider than I was last year and that I was racing bike right there, that I was racing... Uh, my bike as opposed to like learning on it and I just want to be competitive at the end of big bike races have you got any quantifiable sort of parameters for that uh, parameters like- well right now I know I'm doing the Dauphin Dolph- again and I uh, I want to be be good for that you know to see like a yeah a top 20 or something you know? yeah I, I want to, I want to like put that. the crunch on you and, yeah. and make you put something out yeah, there yeah. because I know this myself that how much goal setting really does and I remember writing some stuff down in my diary 10 years ago someone told me to do it and I thought this stuff is bullshit you know it's yeah. not going to matter I yeah, wrote yeah. three race wins down yeah. and I thought you know what I'm never going to do that but if it's just going to shut this guy up I will and all of a sudden I had two race wins that year and I was just like what the hell yeah. what the hell just happened so yeah, yeah. what I was trying to do is like alright put something out there you know it might be just like bigger than Ben Hur but yeah. you never know what will happen yeah but even just um, like obviously uh, my first half of the season I have 
the opportunity to race my bike in the smaller races and I want to be going well enough that the team's like oh shit Jimmy's going going well now and then I get a call up to do another race that's a bigger one mm. it's like a compliment I guess um, so I mean with, with the nature of the sport people always uh, can't do the race and then they're looking for someone else it'd be cool to be that person where they're like you know is valuable mm. um, but yeah nice alright well then what about your overall ambition goal with cycling you've come in now you've experienced it for a year you've got probably your hands on what this world's going to be like you know what you want to do next year what's your whole ambition for your career as a cyclist if you can look ahead 10 years and still be riding in 10 years is that something you want to do ride for 10 more years or you want to just ride the Tour de France or now what, what are you thinking now now you've sort of got your head around it it's a good question and something that people don't usually ask as well because like, there's some bike riders I mean this time last year I, as I said I didn't know what I'd signed up for so I couldn't one yeah. set goals because I didn't know what the racing was and I didn't know the standard and two I didn't know whether I even wanted to do this in the long term but it was an opportunity a once in a lifetime opportunity but now that I've had the year that I had I can look back at it and be like right, I want to be doing this for as long as possible because mm-hmm. there are some some riders where they, they have their first like Australian riders that have their first Neo Pro season and they're like this is really really difficult I don't think I can justify doing this for another X amount of years um, but I'm fortunate enough to be in a space where I'm like I'm proud to be doing what I'm doing yeah. um, and to be like quite obsessed about it <laughs> Um, in a good way in a good way yeah. I think you know the people always yeah say obsessions are bad but I think in order to do this properly you have to be you have to be obsessed you have to be yeah. like addicted to everything yeah like, it's, it's the life now and it's daunting like last year not knowing whether I, I liked it but um, yeah I'd love to be doing this for as long as possible um, I think uh, it's a pretty incredible opportunity you get to and it's also just incredibly satisfying mm. Um, obviously being a runner I never had that team as- aspect mm. so to like share results with people whether that be riders or staff and also just being a good team yeah it's um yeah yeah nice it's, it's different and it's like I agree yeah. 100% with you it's it's an individual thing because you get that satisfaction when you're out yeah. training on your own and you're doing all these stuff you're so happy when you get home you achieve that training yet you get to the race, you're able to apply that to a team environment and that's even another yeah. s- form of satisfaction. Yeah. So It just makes you feel incredibly alive, whether that be for a good reason or a bad reason. It's, it makes you... You're on your toes. Mm. And, um, yeah. I mean, life life is, can, is always back on pause here. It's, you know, if, I'm lucky I've got family and friends and, and agree to fall back on. But, um, yeah, that can, that can be in the backseat for hopefully as long as possible. Great, mate. Well, you've set it up for a big year, and I'm I'm looking forward to racing with you this year, hopefully a little bit more. Yep. Um, so, mate, thanks very much for being on the pod and previewing the season for you and for everyone. Yeah, cheers. Thanks. Well, Mitch, you're off to a flyer. That was a really engaging conversation with Jimmy Whelan. I I feel like I can call him Jimmy now, not just James. I feel like I've got to know him a little bit through your conversation as well. You can refer to him as James, Jimmy, or as I prefer, Jimmy Half Whelan, because he does like to have that half wheel in front of you. (laughs) That was one of the things I took out of the conversation, Mitch, and I I did actually go back and listen to a little bit of your original conversation with Jimmy when he was a fresh out of the box Neo Pro a year ago and there was quite a contrast I felt between the two Um, I won't go as far as to say that a a year in the pro ranks has, uh, uh, has, has worn him down so too much but definitely the realities of the job of a professional cyclist Um, you you know something that he would probably have imagined before stepping into the pro ranks I got the sense that he's well aware of what the job actually entails now look I think in a way it's humbled him and I think not just him but I think this happens a lot with a lot of professionals myself included and that's what I really was interested in talking to James about was what has he learnt and how's he going to use what he's learnt for the next season and that's what I loved hearing about in this podcast was he's taken all that on board and 
he's going to go forward and use everything he's learnt and hopefully become, because physically he's already a professional, but he's just got to mesh those two things together. So I'm really excited to see what's going to happen this year. And it was great to hear it out of his words, out of his mouth today about what's going to happen. I also got a feeling that there was a sort of almost like a mentoring relationship between you and Jimmy, because obviously you're, you know, the experienced pro, 12 years in the ranks and he he's just coming into into it and you know learning from um you know what not just the the job of trying to win bike races uh, as an individual i thought that that was one little line that really stood out you know he, he, realizing the importance and the emphasis that put on being a being a team player especially when you're a young rider and i went back and had a look at his race program from 2019 and just sort of saw the realities of um, being a, 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 a neo pro kind of writ large in black and white you know the schedule in the second half of the season was um, tour of Utah and then eight or nine days later he's back in Europe to do the Deutschland tour in Germany and then 10 days after that he's back over in Canada to do the the two world tour races and then seven days after that he's back in Europe doing a couple of Italian races and that sense of you know the the, the pro season is never done until it's done is it? Exactly right. And by no means do I know everything in professional cycling is by a long way. But all I want to do is, if I can, just provide some kind of help or some some information that I've learned along the way to help someone along their way too. Because that's what happened with me. Older guys were able to give me that little insight. And if I can give anyone a little insight that's going to help them bypass some of those struggles, that's all I'm trying to do. And I... I hope that um, James was able to take on some kind of advice that I was able to give him. I'm not too sure, but I get the feeling it was a it was a really constructive conversation for both of us. And I always learn a lot out of it, all of my podcasts, and even again from James in in this one. Well, that's the first podcast of 2020, the first episode of Life in the Peloton. Uh, that's a wrap for this one but you'll be back in a couple of weeks Mitch with another episode of Life in the Peloton and I'm looking forward to hearing from you who that's going to be yes we've been able to get some recordings here at Tour Down Under so there's a couple good ones there in the bank and I've just got to work out who's going to be our next guest on Life in the Peloton so hang in there we've got some good ones coming in along the way well let's wrap up there Mitch um I'd like to say a big welcome to everybody from the Life in the Peloton family. I like the way you describe the cycling podcast as a family, so I'm going to describe the Life in the Peloton crew as a family too. Welcome along. Um, check out some of our other podcasts on the on the feed. We talk about professional cycling. We cover the Grand Tours, um, and there's various other th- shows that we do as well. Delighted to have Life in the Peloton as part of the stable. And for cycling podcast listeners, if you want to follow mitch's adventures on instagram the instagram handle is life in the peloton couldn't be simpler so until next time thank you very much mitch thanks lionel